I'm Dr. G, and for the past 10 years of my life, I've been passionate about all things holistic healing. I've been committed to healing myself and others from the inside out by incorporating some of the most effective modalities for healing the mental, the emotional, and the physical. I've learned that they give us the opportunity to be our most authentic and powerful selves. Heal Thyself is a show dedicated to just that. Today's show is going to be incredible, and I say it every week, of course I do, because it is incredible. Knowledge bombs of digestible information to empower and create clarity on what the highest version of us looks like. Product reviews to provide informed consent so you can buy the safest and best products out there. Better than the first two that I spoke about, and you're getting other B vitamins, which are energizing, right? Get off of it, throw it away. And special guest segments with some of the brightest and most elite minds in their field. So what is that like on my nervous system? Six hours of holding that emotion. Here's the earth, here's the mechanisms and mechanics of an earth when it breathes. We would think much different about that asthma patient that shows up. All to create change in all the parts that make you, you, so we can start healing ourselves and each other. So if you're suffering from things like heartburn, IBS, inflammatory bowel disease, right, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, these are signs that your digestive system may be off at some point in this stepwise progression of digesting food. So the question is, is where, why, and how? So what are the, some of the ways we can support the stomach? So by far, I mentioned chewing your food, being present with your food, no phone, no TV, no conversations. This is the number one thing for helping your stomach, supporting your stomach. Increasing gastric fluid, so, so important. So you gotta be present with your food so you can support your stomach. What else? Don't drink a ton of water with your food, right? Drink it before meals, about four ounces or with food, but not too much. A lot of us get used to and we're stuck in the cycle of drinking so much soda or juice or water with our food. And what that's doing is temporarily causing an increase in the acidity of the stomach. It's making more alkaline, which we don't want. And it's reducing, so it's basically diffusing, reducing that stomach acidity. We want it to be stimulated, ready to work. What else? Bitters, bitters, they're aromatic alcohol-based herbal preparations. They use them a lot in cocktails, you see them in bars. But the one I like is the one by Quicksilver. There are these just uh, bitter pump, it's a pump, and it just, uh, you, what you do is deliver the bitters under the tongue. You do it right before meals. There's one, there's also a really good one by Urban Moonshine Apothecary. But bitters, are, you might have heard of gentian or orange peel. Um, those are really important bitters. So if you're having an issue with digestion, like you're, you're, you're feeling heartburn or you're feeling bloating immediately, bitters may help. You also uh, may find ginger really helpful for the stomach, uh, especially something like ginger tea, uh, particularly if you're prone to nausea. But ginger has been really helpful too for stomach support. And anecdotally, I found that apple cider vinegar before meals, about a tablespoon and four ounces of water, is really helpful for stimulating that stomach acid before meals, okay? But really, when it comes to digestion, it's in digesting fats. Without the liver, you wouldn't be able to fully break down fats. Like the pancreas, it also has a role in helping control blood sugar, but the liver is super resilient because it has so many jobs day to day on the to-do list. Uh, but bile, 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 that's what's helping break down that fat. It's stored in the gallbladder. So one of the telltale signs as a practitioner that I look for, if there's complaints of digestion of fats, is, okay, what's going on in the liver? What's going on with the gallbladder? Is it clogged? Is it not, is it not producing bile efficiently? Is it not releasing it efficiently? Really, with that, some, that's things we have to look for, especially like, let's say every time you eat a fatty meal, right? Almond butter and avocado. You're starting to feel, oh, in my stomach, I just, I get pain in my stomach every single time, or I feel really bloated, or I feel like it's stuck in my stomach. Well, those are things you really have to start talking to your practitioner about because they need to look at your liver and your gallbladder, okay? Think sulfur-rich foods, cruciferous veggies, kale, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all the ones that if you put in a little container and you open it in the middle of the workday on an airplane, even worse, it's going to smell. Those, that's sulfur being liberated and released. But this sulfur-rich foods are going to be helping your liver, not only giving it nutrients, but also helping it detoxify. Pancreas is going to help in the digestion of fat, just like the liver. It's also going to digest protein, carbohydrates, right? You also have hormones in the pancreas, like insulin, that's gonna be reducing the blood sugar. Glucagon, which is gonna help raise the blood sugar like the liver can do too. 
And then it releases other enzymes that help control the appetite or stimulate stomach acid. So the whole system is intimately connected. But when you think about the pancreas, you got to think about iron-rich foods, B vitamin-rich foods. The pancreas loves these, loves spinach. It has both iron and B vitamins. What else? Sulfur-rich foods. I mentioned all about those in the liver. I won't mention it again, but really important. What else? Sweet potato. It's interesting because it kind of looks like a pancreas, and that's called the doctrine of signatures. There's no evidence with it, but it's very interesting because the correlation between, wow, this sort of looks like this in the body, and it just so happens a lot of the time that food is helpful for that part of the body. Well, Nah, the same goes with sweet potato. So what we know is sweet potato will help control blood sugar, but also has constituents and antioxidants that are helpful in protecting the pancreas. Always think antioxidants for organs, antioxidants particularly for the pancreas. So green tea matcha, all the variety of fruits and vegetables, different colors. As I mentioned, sweet potato, which is rich in beta carotene, another important antioxidant. Berries, cherries, raspberries, blackberries, all the berries varieties and cherries, really important at uh, helping support, and grapes helping support the pancreas. And I really like reishi. Reishi is something that uh, is antioxidant rich, but also has certain compounds that help support the pancreas. All right, so now we've cleared it. We're nearing the two most, one of the two of the most important parts. The whole thing's important, all right? But we gotta talk about the small intestine. You're gonna have food here for about two to six hours, but this is where all the action happens. This is where you are absorbing the nutrients and it's interesting, right? Because you're not what you eat, you're what you absorb. If your small intestine is not working correctly or is compromised, you're not getting the optimal maximum amount of nutrients from your food. So if you ever hear of intestinal permeability or more commonly called leaky gut, that's when the lining, the lining of your digestive system is compromised. And what happens is it's made up of gap junctions. And I want you to think about it this way. Think about uh, there's a protective communicative net over your home and it protects your home and your family and your pets, and it's giving off signals to the neighborhood that everything is safe and healthy in this little area. Now imagine there's holes that are being teared and opened up in this net. So not only is the whole communication between the neighborhood compromised, but also you have to think about what's coming in, what's coming out. That protective net is, the harmony is compromised completely. So this, the system, the health of that home and the neighborhood is now, vulnerable. So think about the same way in digestion. When that net, that protective net has holes or tears or any vulnerability due to an insult, then the whole body is going to be at risk, not only the digestive system. And that's why I try to bring this up. It's so important to understand that systemically when there's an issue with this cytoplasmic connection, these gap junction, it can affect our whole system. If you're not thinking microbiome, which is the second part of digestive health, then you're not optimizing not only your digestive health, but also your systemic health. So how do we support our colon? Fiber, 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 fiber. All the fruits, all the vegetables, and that's it, right? You wanna support your system, you gotta start eating the fiber. Remember, it's always take the crap out and put the good in, all right? Man, I really hope that helped. The way I think about hormones is, especially sex hormones, which I'm really covering right now, it's a very sensitive system. It's always in flux. There's intricacies left and right. And what we know is that when one is in balance, the chances are another one might be out of balance or there'd be overcompensation. But today I wanna talk about, for both men and women, about estrogen, okay? And the, the, the really interesting thing about hormones as a whole is they have a synergistic communication, right? It's between the brain and the organs, and then the organs will feed back to the brain, and the brain will go, okay, I'll reduce those stimulating hormones, okay, and then we, it's, it's a circle. It's a circuit where we want to optimize that circuit. We want to optimize communication, but we also want to remove the things that imbalance and affect our hormones. So I want you to understand this concept. Hormones and balance for many different reasons, right? They're very sensitive. So if you think of things from like sleep, disrupted sleep, poor sleep, not enough sleep, electronics, that blue light that I talk about so much, poor quality foods, inflammatory foods, toxic exposures like plastics, heavy metals, pesticides, infections, inflammation, chronic stress. We also have genetic predispositions that we see epigenetically through the environment. There's a stimulus that express different sort of disruptions in our body. So what I want to bring to light is not only what affects our hormones, but how do we mitigate those effects and optimize our health. So let's start with estrogen, right? 
for both men and women, you know, women produce a lot more estrogen than men, but yes, men, fellas, we got some estrogen in us, all right? But estrogen regulates growth, development, and physiology of the human reproductive system, right? It's a super important sex hormone. But for women, they're going to be producing the estrogen primarily through their ovaries, premenopausally, but then postmenopausally, it's mostly going to come from adrenal androgens. But the hormone has an expansive reach. It binds different organs throughout the body and has physiological effect once it's binding. So what are the symptoms of low estrogen? Well, we know there are a few. Bone loss, thinning of the bone, hot flashes, insomnia, joint pain. We may see some skin, itchu- skin issues, skin itching, low sex drive, painful sex, right? What about persistent UTI? What happens is the urethra starts thinning, mood swings, brain fog, depression, all these changes you might see. Particularly think about when a woman's going through menopause, these really start coming up, but they can manifest for other pathological reasons before menopause, right? Breast tenderness, night sweats, vaginal dryness, weight gain, all right? So very important to understand that as much as we need estrogen, once it dips too low, Oh, there's a slew of symptoms. So what are some of the root causes of low estrogen? Well, excessive training, excessive exercise, really low body weight, extreme bouts of stress. You may notice that uh, you may have missed your period because you were super stressed this month. That that means your estrogen is dipping to the ground, dipping to the toilet, right? Eating disorders, anorexia, pituitary gland dysfunction, where that initial signaling hormone is coming from, thyroid disorders like hypothyroidism. PCOS, cysts in the ovaries, fertility medications. If you're breastfeeding, your prolactin is going to be high. Well, that's going to reduce your estrogen. Smoking is going to reduce blood flow to your ovaries, autoimmune diseases, kidney diseases, even chemotherapy. And I mentioned medications, but also the pill, the patch, the ring, implants, injections, also opioids. These are all going to affect your estrogen. What are some symptoms of elevated estrogen, right? Estrogen dominance, acne, dysmenorrhea, these are painful periods, painful cramps, bloating, menorrhagia, which are heavy bleeding around your periods, right? Mood swings, sleep disruption, swelling in the body, cold hands and feet, low sex drive as well. Tenderness in the breast, you may notice cystic breasts, right? Fibroids in the uterus, weight gain, and men, we see erectile dysfunction, gynecomastia, right? That's breast tissue, infertility, feminization. So high estrogen in men and women are going to predispose us long-term towards thyroid diseases, heart disease, stroke, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. So I remember when I was working in my residency, every patient who had breast cancer, ovarian cancer, we were always testing for their hormones, following their hormones very closely. And then after my residency, I was giving them all of the tests to follow their their hormones all the time because I wanted to see that they were metabolizing it correctly. What causes estrogen disruption? Hormonal contraceptives, estrogen supplementation, obesity, right? You're going to be creating through the enzyme more estrogen in the body, diabetes, PCOS, ovarian cyst, medications again coming up on the list, poor liver clearance, gut dysbiosis, constipation, systemic inflammation. You're also going to have it through consumer goods, exposure through cosmetics, home toxins, foods, plastics. You you heard me talk about this, heavy metals being some of the biggest culprits. But here is my favorite part about naturopathic and functional medicine, right? So say you saw this and you fall into one of these pictures and you go, oh man, I may have estrogen dominance or my estrogen may be down in the dumps. I need to go see a doctor. Well, conventionally, unfortunately for the most part, they're going to test one form of estrogen, maybe all three, but we're not going to be able to see how they metabolize in the body. Really important. We also need to see how progesterone complements it. Where's your cortisol? Where's your DHEA? We need to understand the full picture, how your testosterone looks, right? What's the full picture of the hormones? Are they, do, are they cycling and feeding back to the brain? Do they have all of the cofactors they need? This is a holistic view of hormones which we are totally missing in conventional medicine, unfortunately. So the beautiful thing about naturopathic or functional medicine is that you're not going to come in and we're going to give you a natural herb or a supplement or something to cover up the manifestation of the hormonal imbalance. The fact of the matter is, is that it's our job to look for the root cause, right? What is the hormonal imbalance? Why? So whether you're giving the body what it needs or removing the blocks for healing, that's what we want to look at. Are we supplying the body the balance it needs to 
balance estrogen, balance testosterone, balance progesterone, cortisol, DHA, all of those hormones, are they balancing it naturally? Are we working with the body versus forcing your physiology with a medication? So what are the first three steps to balancing your estrogen, right? You may suspect yourself of having low or high estrogen. The first one is going to be removing plastics or endocrine disruptors in your life, particularly BPA or any of its analogs like BPAS. Removing the plastic bottles, canned foods, dental sealants, unfiltered water, thermal paper. All of these things are acting as xenoestrogens, right? So not only is it binding to receptors in various tissues in the body, but it's also blocking the healthy binding of other hormones that you need. You're also going to find endocrine disruptors in cosmetics, makeup, synthetic fragrances, materials in the home that are off-gassing, cleaning supplies, why I talk about it so much. Our hormones are super sensitive to these endocrine disruptors. Number two, work on your digestive health. If you're constipated, it's going to affect your hormone balance, right? The microbes in your estrobolome, right? The bacteria in your gut that is metabolizing estrogen produce an enzyme called beta glucuronidase. This is what deconjugates estrogen into its active form. When the gut microbiome is healthy, this collection of bacteria produces a balanced amount of this enzyme. But when there's dysbiosis and constipation, this enzyme activity is going all over the place. And what's happening is recirculating unhealthy amounts of estrogen in the body. And number three, one of my favorite cruciferous vegetables. Man, if you're looking at the steroid pathway, right, and looking at all of the steroids and how they're breaking down, you'd see cruciferous vegetables having a beneficial part in almost every single step of the metabolic pathway. Why? These sulfur-rich foods are supporting liver metabolism. They're giving signals in our liver to rev up that detoxification process in the body. Indole 3 carbonyl that's a compound found in these foods. It stimulates these enzymes, and thus now we're promoting a healthy hormone detoxification. And of note, you may have heard this before, but it's best to eat these compounds raw. Now, now, many of you, including me, can't eat them raw. So what I do is I steam them for about six minutes on medium low. Uh, and I know that, yes, it's going to affect the enzyme that's creating indole 3 carbonyl. About 50% of it's going to be gone, but I replenish it with mustard seed powder after I'm done cooking. That's going to replenish the enzyme and give us more of those constituents that are helping our hormone detoxification. So make sure you do both. Things are going to change socially for you. You're going to find yourself uncomfortable and tempted to go straight to the bar. You may find you need a drink to socialize, or you may find that you need a drink to be witty or funny or talk to a large group, whatever stories we told ourselves, you'll see that discomfort's gonna come up. And it's exactly what we need to come back to ourselves. You need to stand clear on what you're grounded in your decision and keep that with a good, really strong, strong focus. And something to remember, really important thing to remember, you can be all of the things that alcohol brings out in you, right? Whether positive or negative. It's a story you told yourself based on a past experience. But if you know how powerful and beautiful your fullest expression of yourself is, then you would not have to worry about judgment for others because it wouldn't exist. But you stay grounded and you can be yourself. You can dance if you think you can. You can be creative and funny and witty if you think you are not. You can be intimate and deep if you think you can't be. All of the stories you told yourself are not true. Everything is accessible for you. And you certainly don't need alcohol to loosen you up. It's a myth, it's an illusion that doesn't serve us anymore. Alcohol simply shows you what is there. I'll repeat that, alcohol shows you what is always there, what's always been there. Now you don't need to rely on it because you made a decision to reduce that or end it. So lean into that discomfort, start showing up and opening up those expressive parts of yourself. It's the most beautiful thing in the world to see someone who's opened up and expressing who they are. You may soon find that you don't align or resonate with the energy at the bars or the clubs or wherever you are frequenting those venues. You may also find that you have a lot less in common with the people that you were spending time with and partying with. You may also find that the time you spend in bars and clubs well, you begin to prefer to do other things that are more creative or fulfilling with your time. Your values will shift. Your relationships will deepen. Your confidence, your confidence socially will elevate. You're going to feel better in your body. And most importantly, of all of this, your energy changes, your frequency changes, and people begin to feel it. They start seeing a healthier physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual version of you, and you are embodying a new self. And that self becomes much more powerful, much more creative, much more inspiring. It's the most beautiful thing. So if you're transitioning and you're having trouble through it, DM me on Instagram. If I don't answer in a week, email me. This is my email, info at docgonzalez.com, info at docgonzalez.com. And then send me what your Instagram handle is. Say I sent you a message. I'm getting off of alcohol. I'm having a hard time or really want to know what steps 
may help me. Here's my situation. I'll go back. I'll find your Instagram handle. I will respond with a voice note and help support you in this transition. Because five years ago, six years ago, when I was doing this transition, I wish that I had some guidance because it can be difficult, especially when you're starting to find your new ground, your new relationships, your new comfortability. All the while, you're trying to find what self-expression means. All the while, you're letting go of these stories of fear that are holding you back from being your high self. It, it can be a little bit of a whirlwind, but I'm here to support you all. So do that. If you feel called and feel that it's time, I'm here for you. So we constantly forget that emotional status plays a major role in our physical health. Where are we emotionally on the spectrum? Are we holding in a lot of crap? That's going to affect our physical. Uh, but it's ironic because emotional management is one of the least concerned areas of psychology and medicine. We don't really teach our children early on how to handle emotions, nor is it part of the research where we understand that this approach to emotional management is the healthiest way. Um, and I'm sure it varies from person to person. If you're an emotional suppressor, you know we become experts in hiding emotion. All right, the authors state it's important to acknowledge that feelings and emotions are not responsible for health disorders and sickness, which I partially agree with, but rather it is the protracted reliance on self-defense against the expression of emotions and feelings that creates attention required for the disease to thrive. In other words, we do so much to hold back our emotions that it creates so much tension within us and it's that environment where disease thrives. But remember, I spoke about telomeres last year. And these are markers of our biological age. And I spoke about how stress or unresolved stress affects longevity. What we're seeing in research is aging and longevity in psychological factors like emotion are becoming more important predictors of health than diet and being active. The theory right now is that folks who emotionally suppress utilize unhealthy coping behaviors right, to release that stress. And also, as I mentioned, the neuroendocrine dysregulation, right? Our nervous system and our hormones are being affected, the stress hormone and our nerves are sensitive, meaning that the bodies can't handle stress comfortably. And in essence, this is laying the foundation for disease. 2012 Journal of Health and Psychology authors did a meta-analysis, which is a review of all of the studies on the relationship between repressive, and repressive coping and somatic diseases, right? How does it manifest in the body? And this review assessed over 6,000, over 6,500 participants. And what we saw was a significant association with repressive coping and as I mentioned before, again, cancer, cardiovascular disease, hypertension. So what are some solutions, right? Okay, so we hear all this, you know, someone's listening to go, I'm an emotional suppressor. What the heck do I do now? Really, I want to give you some solutions. First, it's perspective. We have to understand what emotions are. They're energetic waves that pass, right? You are allowed to feel energy in motion, emotion. You can feel and honor that charge, but because you're doing so, you're bringing awareness to them. Ask yourself, where, when did your relationship with emotion start? How did it start? How did it look? And understand that it's not you. It's not the person. It's your personality. But again, it's not you. It's an adaptation that you've created in life at some point. Maybe you learned it. You're also, you need to bring awareness that you are not your emotions because you're not. It's like saying you're a bumpy road that your car is driving on. You feel the bumps, but it would be silly for us to think that we're the road because we're not. We're actually the driver. So too is the truth of emotion. You feel the emotion, but it passes just like a bumpy road. So with this awareness and the perspective that I'm trying to give you, it's an opportunity now to understand that one, you're not your emotions. So therefore you can express them and however you express them is not you. There might be a little bit of a learning curve, especially if you've been repressing for a long time, but honor your feelings. Don't shoot them down. You have gut issues. This is an essential listen. And the thing is, most of us do. It's hard for me to come by someone who has a steel iron clad gut, except my dad, uh, who is not affected with any gut issues. But a lot of us experience bloating, heartburn, burping, gas, diarrhea, constipation, stomach pain, all of those things in between. And it's, it's more and more common, especially when I was in practice, I saw a lot of these patients come in with gut issues. So back in 2007, I just got really bloated out of nowhere from one day to the other, and it just never went away. Uh, and I went to a bunch of gastroenterologists 
and I uh, got a colonoscopy. I got an endoscopy. Uh, I remember that I was still in college and I was going to my physics class and I just came out of an endoscopy and then I was going to take a test and I felt bloated and terrible. But I remember struggling with my gut a lot in that year and particularly because of the stress of uh putting together a lot of these uh, prerequisites to get to school and everything and all. It's besides the point, but it was a lot of stress. Regardless, no doctor ever mentioned very simple interventions for relaxing the nervous system before you eat, right? And that's really important because there's the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic is rest and digest. That's where you heal. That's where you rejuvenate. That's where you restore. Or sympathetic is, as we know, we've talked a lot about it on the show, tiger comes in the room. Everything that happens after the tiger runs in the room, that's sympathetic. And we're not sympathetic when you're in that mode, which a lot of us are, because we carry that past when the tiger runs in the room, right? Uh, We carry that stress with us. And every time we're reprimanded at work or we come across an email or we're in traffic, we stimulate our body as if we are running away from that tiger. And so too does our gut function and our gut health suffer. Before you eat anything at all, make sure you have time to yourself. This is very important because if you are suffering with gut issues, you have to make sure you make time for yourself. You need about 20 or 30 minutes to tell your nervous system that it is safe to eat. You need to switch out of that sympathetic nervous system, which most people are walking around every single day, all day with, and tell our body and give permission to our body that yes, start the systems, let's shift the mode, start the systems head to toe that are going to be supporting our digestion, okay? Because if you haven't shaken off the drama from the night before or that morning or the afternoon, and your body doesn't care to digest any of the food at that point. So if you're suffering with any gut issues, take the time to be alone. Now is not the time to eat your meals and conversate, right? Now is not the time to eat your meals and scroll through social media, right? To eat your meals and even listen to music. You want zero distraction and you want to be you and the food. And before you eat, there's a big, big tip. It's been so helpful for me. Before you eat, take 30 seconds to a minute to do breathing exercises. So then, even if your body is getting into parasympathetic, you're really gonna skyrocket it into making sure that your body is in full parasympathetic present mode. You're breathing, your body knows it's safe to eat, your parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Step two, chew your damn food, right? Remember mom used to say, chew your food every time you were scarfing it down after playing outside? That happened to me so many times where she was right. You need to chew your damn food. Right, you're here. You're basically helping support your esophagus and your stomach, and that's reducing the workload. Especially if you have gut issues, this is major, 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 major intervention that a lot of people are not talking about. But it's so simple, especially if you're bloated or suffering with heartburn. Right, so chewing your food till it's completely pulverized and you can't chew anymore is giving a lot of love to your organs, especially because you're already beginning to break down carbohydrates in the mouth already by chewing properly. But I've been guilty of that. I used to have a bulldog when I was younger and we'd give him like, you know, some a piece of table food. He, I swear he would do two chews and a swallow and he couldn't possibly have broken down that food in his mouth. But I've been guilty of that too. And I've actually been out to eat and seen people go on a gentle walk around your workplace or neighborhood after eating. And this helps on a, a many, many, many levels. When I say gentle, make sure it's gentle. This isn't a power walk, right? You don't want to stimulate sympathetic nervous system action in your body, right? Because then that's going to disrupt the digestion of food. But when you stimulate the parasympathetic, you're also helping support through moving softly and gently on a nice walk, supporting digestion, but you're also stabilizing the blood sugar. So you're optimizing that nutrient absorption in your body and your body's going, okay, good. Uh, I'm in a good place. Blood sugar is good, right? digesting well, pancreatic enzymes breaking down food, right? Stomach acid is ready to go. Where that's, that's how you know you're in a good place and you'll feel it. It'll reflect in your digestive system. You'll have less bloating, less heartburn, better bowel movements, less stomach pain, less gas, all that stuff, okay? So there you have it. I wanna share all of my holistic tips and interventions for great skin and why. First intervention, protect, protect, protect. You know how I talk about the sun, you know how much I love the sun. It's actually a core tenant of health and healing. In my book, it's it's, the sun is everything. And you'll remember 
UV intensity varies. So I mentioned this. When there's a sunrise and you're exposed to the sun, it's minimal UV. Whereas when you get a strong dose of midday sun, 10 to 2, then you're going to get more UVs. So I do recommend the sun, and I recommend exposing your maximum amount of skin for about 20 to 30 minutes, right? Darker skin, a little bit more. But you shouldn't burn, and it shouldn't start getting uncomfortable. Now, pay really close attention because the UV... As much as the sun is healing, the UV can damage skin. So that's what, I, that's what I say. Get a healthy dose and then you know go back in the shade or protect yourself after. But antioxidant-rich foods are the source of protecting the harmony of your body. And this is why antioxidant-rich foods are fruits and vegetables you want to have in your diet all the time. All the different colors, which have different antioxidants to do different things in the body, and servings throughout the day, unlimited servings, but this is gonna be the first step to really helping your skin, your skin health, acne, glow, whatever it is, skin health overall. Because what happens is oxidation over time is the reason you're rapidly aging. That's what happens. Oxidation of the skin causes premature aging, all right? So with oxidation comes inflammation. So inflammation is the other point that I need to make. Chronic inflammation is a fire burning in the body. And if you are inflamed, you are creating oxidation in the body. See the cycle? Oxidation is causing inflammation. More inflammation is causing more oxidation. So over time, they're going to take away from your internal environment, your internal health, that Garden of Eden analogy. Ultimately, it's reflecting on your external appearance. Appearance. So what is the root cause of it? Well, we know major root cause of inflammation is a standard American diet. Processed oils, simple carbs, high sugars, food colorings, other chemicals, major inflammatory uh, foods, major inflammatory diet. That's going to be a major push on what's happening as far as inflammation. So the question is, can you adapt an anti-inflammatory diet? Can you eat mostly fruits, mostly vegetables as the base of your diet? What about chronic infections? That's another source of inflammation we don't think about, but is it wreaking havoc on your immune system? Chronic stress, are you in a place or space that is keeping you from in fight or flight as always? What about trauma from your past? What about anticipatory anxiety of the future? These are all signals from your brain that tells your system release more stress hormone. Chronically, what's happening is that's a slow burn of inflammation. This is the number one factor that's aging you. Biologically premature aging, and then our physical ages. So it's very important to control stress, 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 stress. Your skin will never look amazing, glowing, youthful, and radiating if you are persistently stressed. This is why people who do things like breathwork, meditation, gratitude, affirmations, whatever it is, an exercise program, when they're reducing that daily bucket of stress, that's why all of a sudden people are like, hey, Jan, you look great today. I mean, you look like uh, you have a glow to you. You have some redness in your cheeks. Will, look at your energy. You look, you just, you, you, you're you shining, you're glowing. This is, this is why you're reducing that stress load in the body. So the question is, are you toxic? Is your skin suffering from, as I mentioned before, poor air quality, persistent inflammation in the body? What are you putting on your skin, right? One, one uh, application, two, 10. Is it gonna do much, but over time, What's happening with that bucket of inflammation? Uh, is it absorbing and causing localized inflammation? What about body lotion? All these things are really important. Remember, health is holistic. It's not just one answer. Skin health is not found in a pill. It's not found in a cream. How about collagen? Oof, this is, this is the major one that we think. We, people take collagen, especially all, all, all these health influencers that I see really talking about collagen is the reason I stay so glowy and young. Well, maybe. Um, Collagen is basically the main structural protein in the body. It is in the skin, in the cartilage, ligaments, tendon, and bone. Without it, we'd be a puddle of skin, all right? Skin, muscle, and bones. We'd just be on the floor. And it's what makes our skin plump and gives us that flexibility. You know, when you pull on your skin and it goes back, that's collagen. Better the collagen, the more elastic and hydrated and youthful your skin looks. The reason the skin sags when we get older is because collagen declines. It happens when we get older. It's a natural process, or so we think. So do collagen products work? Yes and no. For everyone, no. If your body needs to utilize those collagen peptides for other processes, you better believe it's gonna utilize it for other processes. Remember I said skin is the last pillar that the body wants to get to. It, it heals the internal environment. If you need healing internally, let's say in your gut, I promise you your body's gonna go, let's hold off on the skin and let's give the gut a little bit more love. So that's why collagen peptides don't always work for everyone. Study-wise, it proves that point. It's mixed. Some studies say it doesn't work at all. Other studies say it helps with skin hydration and elasticity. 
For me, more impor important than uh, collagen peptides are the precursors to collagen, right? What actually tells your body's own your, your body's genes and those proteins to be created. Uh, what tells your body it's time to make some more collagen, basically. So vitamin C, major, major for skin health. Always think skin health and vitamin C. Why? Well, vitamin C not only helps stabilize the collagen that you already have, but it's also going to signal the synthesis of more collagen in your body. Amazing stuff. So eat your berries, eat your citrus foods, eat your peppers, eat your papaya, eat your mango, eat your guava. Make sure you're getting in more vitamin C in your body. What else? What are some of the precursors? Proline, glycine, lysine. These are amino acids that are the stable backbone of collagen. So uh, where do you get those? Well, if you eat animals and animal products, you can get them from meat, fish, and eggs, but you also can get it from cabbage, soy, watercress, sesame, chives, beans, legumes, seaweed. This is why it's very important to have variety in your diet. Please don't be eating the same stuff every single day, okay? So back in 2018, we got a little bit of a glimpse of from the renowned Lancet Journal of how dangerous alcohol can be. The article concluded, the results confirmed that alcohol is a major avoidable risk factor for non-communicable diseases such as liver cirrhosis, some cancers, cardiovascular disease, as well as injuries resulting from violence and road clashes and collisions that we know, the short and the long term. Dr. Karina Ferreira Borges is a manager of alcohol and illicit drug program at the World Health Organization, and she was the one who said that quote. You can find this article on the World Health Organization website where they're talking about the detrimental effects of alcohol, but the study in the Lancet back then proved and showed that the findings of the connection between alcohol drinking patterns and 23 different health outcomes. So we've, we've seen in science and in medicine that alcohol is connected to 23 different health, detrimental health outcomes, and there's nearly 3 million deaths globally, which are attributed to alcohol use, including 12% of the deaths in males between the ages of 15 and 49. Now, between that study in 2018 and 2021, there was still a, oh, you know, alcohol can be safe in small amounts, just drink moderately, and it's fine. Make sure you don't binge drink, because that's where all the problems are until June of this year. Science believe that alcohol can be consumed in small amounts and it would be safe. And yeah, binge drinking is the problem. But now we know that's not true, right? The Oxford University showed that no amount of alcohol is safe for consumption. Now the caveat, it still needs to be peer reviewed, but it caused quite a stir in the medical and the alcoholic industry. Forbes wrote a really nice summary for this for the public. The researchers set out to look at what are the effects of alcohol in the brain, right? And they operated from the premise, moderate alcohol consumption is common and often viewed as harmless to brain health. Well, what did they find? First thing they found, no alcohol is healthier than the other. And the belief that wine is healthier than others is false. Alcohol is alcohol. Regardless of the resveratrol in the wine or the probiotics in hard kombucha or the low sugar in vodka or gin, it doesn't matter. Alcohol is alcohol and ethanol reacts very particularly in the body in different systems. And it damages the body every single time you drink. The second thing they found was that there's no safe dose of alcohol for the brain, zero. And even moderate consumption is associated with more widespread adverse effects on the brain than previously ever recognized. So moderate amounts of alcohol, which is about seven glasses of wine or seven spirit drinks or eight glasses of beer, were seen to cause brain changes. And even light drinking can affect brain changes. And that's about three and a half glasses of wine per week, three and a half spirit drinks per week, or four glasses of beer. Regardless, what these researchers have shown is that alcohol is not safe at any level. Contrary to what we were saying right now in science, alcohol should not be consumed at all. My relationship to alcohol started in college. And I found that the one thing that it did was release my inhibitions and gave me this confidence to be this transient, authentic version of myself, right? Oh, I can dance on alcohol. I love dancing anyway without alcohol, but I can really dance on alcohol. Oh, I can really dress up as ridiculous and flamboyant as I wanna be, but alcohol really lets me do it, right? So it was sort of this crutch that removed my inhibition and let me be my most authentic self. The irony is that it's transient. It will come, it will go. The second thing I realized when I was at this bar and I looked around is that everyone, every single person goes to a bar for a community. You either go to connect with a man, with a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman, a group of people. 
but people are going to remember their authentic truth, meaning that we are connected, we are tribal beings, and we want to be accepted within a group and a tribe. Society has created bars and the normality of drinking alcohol in these places. But what I saw in the bar, I looked, and I looked around at everyone's faces at the bar as they waited for their drink. And even the person smiling, I can tell wasn't happy. And even the person who obviously wasn't happy, they have a stone cold look on their face, waiting for their drink. And I realized in that moment, a bar is such an unnatural place to connect. It's so unnatural. And alcohol is the most unnatural substance to bring down your inhibitions and let you feel comfortable in your own skin. And it's incredible that we continuously accept this practice of going to this place and drinking this poison just so we can be comfortable with ourselves and show off ourselves and not feel judged, right? And on top of that, connect and communicate with other people. And I looked around and I said, no one is happy at this bar. We get to see what matcha does in different parts of the body. Now in the brain, matcha has some of the most pronounced effects. It increases the cognitive function, which I mentioned before in the study, but also memory, neuroprotection, meaning it's reducing inflammation in the brain and protecting those cells, decreasing stress in the brain, the oxidative stress, which causes the inflammation, decreasing aging in the brain, decreasing, very important, amyloid plaque production. If you have a history or family history, of brain disease, particularly dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Matcha may be something that would be beneficial to take every single day to protect you in every single way. Super important for the brain. This is a quote from the authors from Molecule Magazine. Systemic inflammation induced by LPS. This is called lipopolysaccharide. It's a bacterial endotoxin that plays a key role in neurodegenerative disease. EGCG, that catechin, that I talked about, the antioxidant inhibits this bacterial endotoxin, which is producing those reactive oxygen species that are causing inflammation in the brain. This suggests that EGCG is a potent and effective neuroprotective agent in neurological disorders mediated by inflammation. The kicker is that almost every neurological disorder, including depression, is driven and mediated by inflammation. So with that said, This is why I push matcha so much is because it's so protective to the brain on every single front. The problem with that bacterial endotoxin that I mentioned, LPS, it affects the blood-brain barrier, so more inflammation is induced in the brain. So as I mentioned, family history of disease, brain disease. Look, my, my grandfather died of Parkinson's disease. That's why I drink matcha every single day. All right, what else? What other parts of the body? Pancreas, it decreases blood sugar, increases sensitivity to insulin. Very, very important because I did a whole show talking about how blood sugar dysregulation in the system is implicated in so many different diseases. What about the liver? Dr. Asia Muhammad is going to go into liver health, but really we know that matcha is helpful at assisting the liver in creating glucose for energy for you. It's reducing hepatitis, the inflammation of the liver. What I was recommending to so many people is if you drink alcohol, which so many of us do, anytime you drink alcohol, at the very least, you should be drinking green tea before drinking alcohol and after drinking alcohol. It's very, very important green tea or matcha, right? So let's say you're drinking, you go out at night with your friends and you drink alcohol. I'm not gonna suggest drinking matcha at night. You're gonna stay up all night, maybe drink some green tea. But the next morning, it's very important to drink matcha. Why? You know, it reduces the reactive oxygen species, which are created by alcohol. The reason alcohol is so damaging to the body and is connected to seven different types of cancers. The reason why alcohol is known to have no safe level anymore. But now we know what it does in the body. So in particular, if we're drinking something that helps negate that oxygenation, reduces the inflammation, known to be anti-cancer, that's gonna be super important if you are still drinking, okay? So make sure green tea or matcha if you drink alcohol before and after. What about your heart and blood vessels? The number one killer in America, right? Heart disease. It reduces oxidative stress and other stress response proteins in the vascular system and reduces those inflammatory pathways and helps on top of that strengthen the blood vessels. What about the gut? Reduces inflammatory cytokines, those proteins that are causing leaky gut. It reduces those inflammatory cytokines and increases glucose and lipid absorption, meaning you're absorbing your food better. What about colon? A lot of studies coming out with green tea and how it affects breast cancer, but also colon cancer. So it reduces tumor growth, the growth of blood vessels to the tumor, right? Because that's how tumors survive. They recruit 
something through a process called angiogenesis, more blood vessels so they can live. It reduces that process and also increases cancer cell death and reduces overall inflammation, which drives cancer. And it's amazing to me in all my years that there's a drink out there that can be protecting you from cancer. And it's anti-inflammatory. And I didn't mention even the antibacterial effects, right? It can help balance bacteria and inhibit the growth of a particular one called P. gingivalis, Prevotella, Intermedia, and Nigrosense, and the adherence of P. gingivalis on the human buccal epithelial cells that cause plaque. In other words, when you're drinking matcha, it's reducing the adhesion of bacteria into those plaque colonies that are causing inflammation and damage to the gums and damage to the teeth. And this is from, uh, it, was, it was really informative, the Mayo Clinic um, article on it. Seasonal affective disorder is a type of depression that's related to changes in the season. Seasonal affective disorder uh, begins and ends about the same time every single year. So you, that's already a telltale sign. If, it, if there's onset, you know around this time of year you feel the same way and then you get better around this time of year, it's likely seasonal affective disorder. If you're like most people with seasonal affective disorder, your symptoms start in the fall and continue into the winter. They get really mad, but really bad in the winter. And then they sap your energy and they make you feel moody. So when it comes to solutions or really why this begins, we can look no further than light therapy. It's one of the best studied and established modalities for helping this. So we had a recent meta-analysis that looked at light therapy and they found that there was a dose response relationship between light therapy intensity and the degree of improvement in typical depressive symptoms, right? So basically the more light therapy you're getting, the better you are. And you may or may not be familiar with this. I actually bought one a long time ago. I believe it was called a happy light. It's a lamp box and has fluorescent bulbs with really intense lux, right? That, that luminous intensity, it's about 10,000 lux. And I spoke about lux when it comes to disruption of melatonin when, uh, when I was doing the uh, sun and the light show. But the recommended daily duration when you use this light is about 30 minutes to two hours per day for two to four weeks. Um, and always I recommend doing that in the morning. It's very important because if you do it at night, 100% it's gonna affect your circadian rhythm. And it's really, really important to get good sleep when you're suffering some, from seasonal affective disorder. So what is this implying? What is the reason? Because we can see if the light therapy is helping, then there has to be a connection between different mechanisms of why we're affected by this. Now that one of the core beliefs in seasonal affective disorder is the neurotransmitter model, which we use a lot to, to intervene with just classic depression. Neurotransmitters are uh, particularly serotonin and dopamine are thought to be affected. Now, if you think about it this way, the sun increases serotonin, right? You get, you get in a better mood, you're stabilized mood. It's a brain happy chemical. And uh, when it's activated, we feel good. In the winter, serotonin drops off, right? So the sun is really giving us more and more serotonin. And we know serotonin increases when, we, when the sun hits us because when serotonin is high, we're usually not hungry. And I don't know a lot of us who really wanna eat a buffet meal when we're on the beach. And that's why, because serotonin is really high. Dopamine is the other uh, neurotransmitter. It's the reward chemical. You know, let's say, let's say you get a like on Instagram or something. That's the, that's the ding that, that you feel. That's the reward chemical. But both of those are linked to depression. Uh, so the thought is that they play a major role in seasonal affective disorder as well. So not only are we getting less sun, but also we're getting less luminosity, right? Less intensity. So less sun, less intensity from the sun, so we're gonna have a drop off on serotonin and dopamine. How do we increase serotonin? Exercise, movement, uh, spending more time in nature, meditation uh, for increasing dopamine, doing, having a tasks, having a, having a list and completing tasks, so checking off tasks is gonna be a really important way. You can really start feeding those. I'm gonna give you a little bit more tangible stuff too. Um, the other thought is hormones, the imbalance of hormones. And we think about how, how tightly wound hormones are to circadian rhythm. So let's put those together because the belief is circadian rhythm dysregulation and hormones are really behind seasonal affective disorder as well. Now, if you think about it this way, the sun is giving our body signals. Those signals are responding in very particular biological clock. Those rhythms are telling our hormones to go up and to go down and then back down and then back up. So the more fluorescent indoor lights you're getting, the less grounding you're getting, your circadian rhythm is going to be off. Think about it. Naturally, when the sun is out, 
we tend to be outside more. We tend to, t- to take off our shoes more, right? We're getting those signals from earth, right? That, that, that electrical chemical signal going through our body through grounding, right? Think about the beach, you're barefoot on the beach, you're walking around in the grass. Those signals are helping our body know what time it is, where it is, how it is. The sun is telling, going through our eyes, going to our brain, telling our whole body about where we are. So circadian dysregulation, all of a sudden, winter comes, you're indoors. You got your shoes on, you got your coat on, you got fluorescent lights on. So the dysregulation, it, 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 I do believe that there's a huge component when it comes to circadian dysregulation, and that's leading to hormonal dysregulation. Because now, a lot of us are waking up, opening the door, putting our feet on the ground, seeing the sun. That's not happening because middle, middle of winter, although I am pushing for a lot of you to step outside, see the sun, or see it, even if the sun's not out, getting the, the UV spectrum of light in the morning is very important. So uh, if your doctor allows it, you have no circulation issues, get outside, put your feet on the ground. I was just back home last week, had my feet in the snow. I was seeing the sun every single day. That's helping circadian rhythms and then it's helping promote better hormonal balance, right? If you suffer from depression or seasonal affective disorder, anti-inflammatory diet, really really important to have your gut health optimal and also brain health optimal because there is an absolute connection between gut health, leaky gut, brain health, leaky brain. So, so, so important because my belief is the onset of all depression has a component with an inflammation of the brain. So you want to eat anti-inflammatory foods, take all that crap out. And a lot of us are predisposed all of a sudden in the winter to start eating more crappy foods, right? Where the holidays come, more crappy foods. Uh, maybe New Year's, your resolution is to eat better. You eat better for a few weeks and then get back to eating crappy foods because it's cold, you're hibernating. But really, if you suffer from seasonal affective disorder, this is such an important time to start implementing real, whole, anti-inflammatory foods, a spectrum, all the colors of the rainbow, rainbows, fruits, vegetables, nutrient-dense food is gonna be the most important thing, okay? Now, you heard me talk about stress so much. I even did a whole show on it. But today we're really gonna talk about, all right, what is stress? How does it manifest? What are the four root causes of stress? And then what are the some of the solutions to it, right? Because long-term stress is a root, 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 root cause for all diseases, okay? Four major key stressors in the human body. Blood sugar control, hypoglycemia. Are you feeling symptoms of hypoglycemia? Dizziness, shaking, brain fog between or after meals. Are you missing or delaying meals? Are you craving carbs? Are you craving sugar? Do you have increases in blood sugar? Pre-diabetes, diabetes. diabetes. Are you craving alcohol, craving caffeine? Blood sugar dysfunction is a major indicator and stressor in the body of what's going on, okay? Mental, emotional stress, another key stressor in the body. Anxiety, depression, mood swings, right? Are you seeing that it's affecting your overall health? Are you inundated with every single day mental, emotional stress, and what are you doing to check that? What's another one? Insomnia, sleep issues. Do you have issues falling asleep, staying asleep? Are you not sleeping enough? Are you not sleeping deep enough? Are you doing shift work? Another major cause, a major stressor in the human body, and the last one is gonna be inflammation. Do you find that you are suffering from an inflammatory disease? Is your body talking to you by manifesting headaches, muscle pain, back pain, joint pain, digestive issues like IBS or inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, skin diseases, eczema, psoriasis, asthma, bronchitis, allergies, autoimmune disease, immuno dysfunction, You want to make sure that these things start getting into check because it's sort of showing your body, you, that your body is really going through an inflammatory response. So blood sugar control, mental emotional stress, insomnia, sleep issues, and inflammation. These are the key stressors to the body. Simple hacks to balance your blood sugar. Do the fast, okay? But then when you break it, make sure when you eat your first meal, it's nutrient-dense, nutrient-rich, it has all the macros, good fat, good protein, good carbohydrates, right? And you want to make sure you're staying away from those refined or simple carbohydrates, those simple sugars. That's going to be a real problem at spiking your blood sugar. You want protein-rich, fiber-rich meals. These are two of the major keys that are going to help balance your blood sugar. I speak a lot about, about prebiotics for a reason. Prebiotic foods are so, so important at balancing your blood sugar too. And these are things like inulin, arabinogalactans. But then you have things like flaxseed powder, konjac root. You want to stay away from high saturated processed foods like those vegetable oils, canola oil, right? Safflower oil, sunflower oil. You don't want any of this, especially ones that are really, really processed. 
You want more healthy fats into your life. Avocados, right? This is like one of my favorite ones that I'm eating, but also things like olive oil. You want to make sure that you're adequately hydrated. That's always going to affect your blood sugar. Exercise and movement, of course, we know that positively affects your blood sugar. Eating lower glycemic foods. If you never heard of glycemic index, check the glycemic index and see what foods in your diet really spike your blood sugar, especially if you're suffering with prediabetes. Now, you want to talk to your doctor about supplements. Some of my favorite ones are alpha lipoic acid, biotin, chromium, cinnamon bark, gymnema leaf, Berberine. These are some of my favorite things at helping balance your blood sugar. But if your blood sugar is out of whack, out of balance, you have blood sugar dysfunction, understand and know that your body is under stress. And this is going to lend towards disease over time. Mental and emotional stressors. This is the second one. This is huge. I always talk about perspective, giving yourself perspective. See, the first step is in seeing and understanding that you are mentally or emotionally stressed, right? And stopping. And first, like, seeing the perspective, stopping everything and going, I can reflect on this and I can understand at this point, let me stop that cycle of feeling on autopilot that I'm stressed. And you can do that, right? First, you have to understand what causes the stress. Where do I feel it? What does it feel like? Is it Does it manifest for me as anger? What about anxiety? What about avoidance, hesitancy, depression? When the stress inciting factor happens, where what do I feel? Where do I feel it in my body? And then this is the stressor. This is how it prolongs. And this is a key moment here. After you have the emotion and feel it somewhere in your body and you have the awareness, the, the part where we go on autopilot and where stress continues in our cycle is we create a story. And we're good at it. We're really good at creating stories. Uh, and we have this narrative that because I missed this deadline, and it may or may not be true, but we, we ruminate over and over and over on this narrative, and that is what continuously causes prolonged stress. So ask yourself, how can I replace that narrative with maybe a story that's a little bit more compassionate to me? And it's a, it's a key move because once you change your perspective and you break that narrative and break that story, it's really powerful because all of a sudden you'll see that stress and stressors are there for you for an experience, for you to ascend, for you to learn, bring gratitude and surrender to it. But really, I want you all to understand, stress propagates over time, over and over, because of our narrative, our perspective. The moment we understand that we have the power to change that narrative, we have the power over mental, emotional stress. I meditate every single day, but sometimes I wanna do some moving meditation. So I'll do something like Tai Chi, yoga, or something more active like breath work. And it's really important because it's sort of hard not to feel something when you do breath work. It's a powerful technique where you feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind, you feel it in your soul. Super, super awesome stuff. If you haven't done it, I'm going to really recommend to do it, but I'm going to talk about some different techniques and the way you can do it. So breath work simply is just following a breathing pattern for a certain amount of time. It's conscious breathing, paying close attention to your breath, which is always sort of the root of everything, right? You're doing Tai Chi, you're moving, but paying attention to your breath. You're meditating, you're paying attention to breath. Yoga, what do they say? Cycle your breath, pay attention to your breath. It's always conscious breathing that is at the root of this because of what it's doing, it brings you to the present moment. When you're in the present moment, that's when you get the real physiological, mental, and emotional benefits. So uh, when you focus on your breath, basically, what you're doing is creating a powerful technique. Some of these techniques are faster, some slower, some have music, some have some drums playing, some maybe solo or some maybe in a group. So it all depends on what, what works best for you. So I want you to all start exploring what works really in alignment with what feels right, how, how you're getting the optimal benefit, just feeling the energy around. Do you like being with people? Do you like the music on? Uh, because you'll find something that really works and is super efficient for you and you can tap into the power of it really fast. When it comes to breath work, it, it pushes the parasympathetic tone. It increases that parasympathetic state. Now, you may have heard me do a show on the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve, we think, is the reason why breath work works. It's stimulated. It stimulates the diaphragm. The diaphragm stimulates the vagus nerve. It goes back to the brain, back and forth. And what you're doing is you're eliciting this calm, peaceful state. The alpha brain, it's peaceful but alert. You're not falling asleep because what's happening is in the brain, it's increasing alpha brain waves. That's a more restful but alert state. You're increasing heart rate variability. HRV, I have this or a ring on, and I have no affiliation with them, but I'm wearing it right now. Every morning I check my HRV. Heart rate variability is going to tell me, all right, let's say my heart rate variability starts at a 90 and everyone's different. 
I know if I don't get any sleep, and if I'm super stressed the day before, the next day it might be a 70. So it's a good baseline to see heart rate variability, meaning how you're handling stress in the body. What else does the science show on breath work? Subjects who do breath work, increase of comfort feelings, relaxation, pleasantness, vigor, re more relaxation overall, but reduced feelings of anger, anxiety, uh, confusion, depression, um, and as I mentioned, it is the vagus nerve that we're really thinking about. Um, and you'll, I did a whole show on the vagus nerve. It was episode 79. And we know that not only that, not only when it comes to the stress and parasympathetic, the vagus nerve will also elicit anti-inflammatory signals to the rest of the body. When you increase your vagal tone, meaning the, you have a strong vagus nerve that is, that is ready to fire and uh, give us all the benefits, breath work is something that can put us in that stronger vagal tone mode. I am gonna to venture to say in so much confidence that if you're suffering with a disease in your body and it's not healing and you've tried one, all of the medications, two, all of the supplements, all of the diets, all of the biohacks, everything, I'm gonna to venture to say that the root cause of your disease that's not leaving you is based on that shadow that you're not looking at. And the moment you look at that shadow and remember your authenticity, you allow yourself to heal, you allow your body to heal. Everything is an opportunity because your body is speaking to you all the time. It's always telling you what it wants. And I am sure, I am positive that my gut issues and my psoriasis are simply rooted in the belief system and the story that I told myself that it is not safe to tell people how important they are to me. It's not safe for me to tell people how much I love them. It's not safe to be vulnerable because at some point it's going to challenge my survival. It's such a, it's such a false story that we live with. So I challenge you all, think about what stories you've told yourself. Think about if you're holding anything in. Think about if you're not being true to your authenticity. Think about when you were a child, what it was to be fully open and curious and flowing through life and seeing a bee for what it is, seeing a tree for what it is, without any words, without even naming it as a tree and truly experiencing it for what it is. I challenge you to think back to that time in your life. And if that is part of your life and you can tap into it, understand that it never left. And the very things that are holding you back are illusions. They're false, they're mirages, they're stories, and they're not rooted in anything but the same feedback loop that you've been telling yourself over and over. And I'm challenging you to break that feedback loop and allow yourself to be vulnerable and allow yourself to be open. Allow yourself to tell your dad you love him, to tell your brother or sister you love him, to tell your partner you love them, to tell your friends you love them, right? Life is short, can end tomorrow. But the power in expressing your truest, highest, most authentic self without fear and living in love will heal the world tomorrow if we all did it. So there you go. My knowledge bomb on love, authenticity, alignment, vulnerability. You all have this within you. It's not within reach. You don't need to climb a mountain, right? You don't need to do a retreat. You don't need anything. You don't need a teacher. You just need to understand that you've been telling yourself a story that's not true. And take that step, that, dis that uncomfortable step that's really hard in the beginning, but open up yourself, expand yourself, fall in love with yourself, fall in love with others, fall in love with everyone. Tell people they're great. Tell people they're wonderful. I love my crew. You guys are amazing. I love my producer. You guys are amazing. And I love you all. Thank you for listening. In your experience and in the time where you were in foster care, and all the traumas that you were alluding to, right? The pain of foster care, the, the anger that you had, whatever experiences, they were real. They were very real when you were in that moment. But at some point, they weren't real anymore. At some point, you were in a safe home or at some point you were by yourself. The conditions changed, right? Your nervous system was still believing that you were in foster care and therefore your ego held on to that identity and that adaptation through your life. But I go, but look inside. I go, you're eating at Cafe Gratitude. Look around, it's safe. Your partners, they are waiting for you to come back. I go, the story that you've told yourself about foster care was true in that moment, but it's not your reality anymore.
It's not true. It's, it's a story that we think has roots, but it's just floating in the air. And we're only recognizing it because it's been there for so long. But what I want to challenge you all is think about just today, write out, write it out, sit down, open a journal and write out stories that are sponsoring your life, right? For me, I'll be fully transparent. I would write out, I'd be like, I do not cry. I am, I'm not a, a crier. I am not adventure seekings. I am risk averse, right? So I've told myself this story that I hate roller coasters and I hate jumping off of cliffs and I'm risk averse, right? But at some point I've always wanted to do things like that. But my story that I told myself was that I don't do those things. The story that I told myself for so many years, more of my life, right? Was that I don't cry. I'm just not a cry. I've never been a crier. That's so false. But I challenge you all to write out what stories are sponsoring your life, right? I do not. I am not. I will not, right? And start seeing them for what they are because once you write them out and have a list and it's in front of you, you get to see, well, I, like it doesn't serve me anymore. Like I actually want to take risks. I want to have fun. I want to be on a roller coaster. Why am I telling myself this story that at some point when I was young, maybe I did have a bad experience on a roller coaster, but it may not be true ever again. Why did I tell myself that I don't do these things? Why did I hold myself back from expressing or crying or whatever it is, right? But my challenge to you all is to write out all of the things and all the stories that are sponsoring your life with no root to it. And after I told this man this, he puts his hand on his chest and he breaks down in the middle of Venice crying. And I felt so much compassion for him because in that moment, he was liberated from a story that is not true anymore. He was liberated from those memories that don't serve him anymore. He had permission to start ascending to a new self. He had permission to start being in his authenticity. And that's the crazy part. In your authenticity, you are your most powerful you've ever been. And this man in particular, who let go of that story of his past and who let go of all of his identifications that he had in that moment, has now created a space to be a way more powerful, way more radiant person. And with that power and that radiance and that authenticity that you present yourself with, you start healing not only yourself, but your loved ones, not only your loved ones, but the people you put pass on the street, the person you talk to in the middle of the supermarket, all of these people's lives you start touching because they don't start seeing you for you. They start feeling you for you. You start expressing your energy so differently. You start motivating people and you give people the permission to do exactly what you're doing for yourself. And that is living in your authenticity and living in your vibration. And that is our God given gift. It is what we're here to do, to be our highest selves and to start healing each other and the world. And this is the power that we have once we let go of all of those stories and all of those false identifications and all of those false ideas and ideologies that are not real and they do not serve us and they're rooted in fear. They're holding you back like anchors from the love that you are. And that's the exact moment and the exact thing that happened with this young man. And I want you to understand that you all have that same power. Just like matcha is an everyday staple for my day, so is my magnesium supplement. It's the one that I use by BioOptimizers. It's super important. 75% of people are not getting enough sleep, and it's because they're not having enough magnesium in their diet and in their lives. So the magnesium that I use and been using for quite a while now is the Magnesium Breakthrough. It's my favorite one. You all have to check this one out. It is the best one on the market. It contains seven unique forms of magnesium, right? Other supplements, they're cheap. They contain synthetic ingredients, and then you buy them, and they're not helping the magnesium deficiency that we have, and they're definitely not helping you sleep better. And because 75% of us are not getting enough sleep, I'm going to highly recommend using the magnesium breakthrough. The way that I use it personally is I take two before bed and then two in the morning and I'm good. I know I'm meeting my magnesium needs, plus I'm eating magnesium rich foods and I'm feeling good. So www.magbreakthrough.com slash DRG. You're going to save 10% off of your first order. That's M-A-G breakthrough dot com slash drg and the code to use is drg10 and you're going to get this offer thank you bio optimizers majority of cleanses out there are going to do nothing right um because they are not manufactured in the way that 
we need to be working and supporting our body. Um, a lot of them are very gimmicky, and I would agree. You have organs that detox, and your body is so elegant, so sophisticated, right? So it's not foolproof, because a lot of us are fools and we damage our body, but it's, it's so resilient. And I, so I want to bring attention that we have a body that detoxes. Um, we just want to make sure that we're optimizing it. How do we optimize the amunctories? Amunctories is a buzzword in the naturopathic world or the functional world. Amunctories is another word for organs of detoxification. So how do we optimize these amunctories? Where do we start? First and foremost, look no further than one of the massive main ones that we have to optimize, and that's our digestive system. This is it. This is how you're detoxing toxins, hormones, bacteria. You're, move, you're removing fiber in the body. Uh, it's essential. You got to be pooping. If you're constipated, this has to be addressed first. Don't buy a detox kit or spend all this money on a detox program if you're not pooping. You have to address the pooping first. So there's this enzyme, and this is something that we don't bring into people's attention, but it's such an important thing to understand. We have an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, and it's really important enzyme in our body. And you can actually measure on a stool test, you could see how active this enzyme is. Well, this enzyme is important for breaking down complex carbohydrates, and that's great. We need that, it's a major benefit. It's, it's adding to healthy digestion. But when you're constipated, the problem is, is this enzyme, right? Estrogen is bound it's bound and it's in your poop and it's ready for detox. Get it out of me. Well, it's, what happens with this enzyme is like a wire cutter cuts through that free, it cuts and frees that estrogen. And what happens that estrogen recirculates in the body. And this is a major issue over time because estrogen at a healthy level is very much so essential, but excess estrogen is no good. And the same goes with the toxins. They recirculate. So then you're at risk for constant bloating swelling and tenderness in the breast, fibrocystic lumps in the breast. You never hear those. And then uterine fibroids. So here's a, here's a, here's a crazy thing that we do with uterine fibroids. We find them in the uterus. They cause pain. We cut them out. And then we go, okay, fibroids are gone. And if you don't have fibrocystic breast, the chances are is that you're going to start growing cysts on the breast. Why? Because we're not addressing the estrogen metabolism in the liver and in the poop. So first and foremost, you have to pay attention. If you have uterine fibroids, that your body is showing you that there's an excess amount of estrogen and we need to clear that instead of surgery. I'm not saying don't get surgery, but you have to look at the root cause. Surgery certainly is not addressing the root cause. What else? Irregular menstrual periods, PMS, poor sex drive, mood swings, more anxiety, changes in your memory, right? Headaches, hair loss, weight gain, Cold hands and feet, trouble sleeping, fatigue, increased risk of breast cancer. So you're not pooping and the estrogen that's recirculating is putting you at risk for all of these things, both short-term and long-term. And if you are suffering from any of these and you're not pooping, you may have just found the root cause of what's going on. Here's the take-homes. We have detox in itself needs to be addressed optimally with our organs. You don't need anything outside of you. What you need to start looking at is how you can support those organs. And there's ways, right? And think about this. This is the, always a philosophy. Give the body what it needs, remove what is an obstacle to healing. An obstacle to healing can be really crappy air in your house. How do you remove it? We'll start removing the sources of the crappy air. Start putting in an uh, air filter. Now you're supporting your lungs. A, a obstacle to healing is, could be your constipation. We'll get to the root cause of why you have constipation, right? Obstacle to healing could be you not sweating, get to the root cause of why you're not sweating. You understand? Obstacle to healing could be just not drinking enough water. Get in that water, good quality water, and start urinating. Open up those amunctories, support them, and, and on the outside, supplements do that, do just that. They supplement this whole detoxification process. In 2019, the FDA submitted a proposal for updating sunscreen regulations, recognizing just two, just two ingredients as safe and effective. That's zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. The problem is in the other ingredients. There are multiple chemicals found in sunscreen that are harmful to human health. In the same 2019 proposal that I mentioned by the FDA, they mentioned that 12 of the active ingredients commonly found in sunscreens, including oxybenzone, need additional data from safety and efficacy tests. And those ingredients that I mentioned are used in more than 60% of the sunscreens out there, which is incredible, right? So chances are over 50% that you're going to choose a sunscreen that has chemicals 
that the FDA is admitting are not tested properly for safety and efficacy. That's incredible. So essentially, we do not have enough data on these chemicals. Avobenzone, oxybenzone, which is the first most common UV filter, octinosate, which is the second most common UV filter, homosalate, octisalate, and octocrylene. And we don't know how safe they are. And on the contrary, we're starting to see that they have harmful effects on the body. Oxybenzone is the most popular chemical, as I mentioned, the, the most common UV filter, and it's readily absorbed through the skin. And the CDC, their fourth national report on human exposure to environmental chemicals, demonstrated that approximately 97% of people have tested for oxybenzone in their urine. And it's not just coming from sunscreen, it's also in personal care products. But oxybenzone is a chemical that we're starting to see is a nasty one. It's been detected also in human breast milk, amniotic fluid, urine, and blood. So in humans, oxybenzone has been reported to produce contact and photocontact allergy reactions. So if you've ever been allergic to a particular sunscreen or itchy or getting a rash, the chances are it's the oxybenzone reacting. Uh, but it's also implicated as a possible, possible endocrine disruptor, meaning hormone disruptor, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, thyroid, all of the hormones that are floating around in our body that are giving our organs signals on what to do can be disrupted. We also see it, that it's been linked to Hirschsprung's disease, which is a bowel disease, which causes constipation. It's also believed to affect the thyroid, super important in metabolism, right? It is the it is the heat center of our body. I think of it like the thermometer of the house. Test Testosterone levels, super important as we get older, us men and women. Kidney function, pubertal timing, breast cancer, and endometriosis. These are all hormone disorders aside from the kidney function one. These are hormone disorders that are pushed. So we've already believed for years that oxybenzone disrupts your hormones, but now we're starting to see that it does have an effect on the way that our hormones are working and causing diseases that are tied to hormone dysfunction. Children, of course, may be more vulnerable than adults to harm from oxybenzone because of the potential for higher absorption and bioaccumulation. And if that wasn't enough, oxybenzone can also react with chlorine. Chlorine, think about it. We put on sunscreen, we jump in a chlorinated pool, oxybenzone has been, has been found to react with chlorine, and guess what? It's producing hazardous byproducts to the human health that can be concentrated in swimming pools. It's incredible, right? So, and this was a few years ago, I put a post about this, but to think that the combination, we never think that, who thinks about that? The combination of the sunscreen and the chlorine, but we do now know that there's effects on the body that are negative to our overall health. Environmentally, oxybenzone has been shown to produce a variety of toxic reactions in coral and fish, ranging from reef bleaching to mortality overall, right? It's killing coral, it's killing fish. It's banned in Hawaii, it's banned in Key West due to the knowing of what it does to the environment and human health. So if you're home, I'm gonna challenge you. Go to your cabinet, go to your pantry, go to your closet, wherever you keep the sunscreen, and see if it has oxybenzone, O-X-Y-B-E-N-Z-O-N-E, -E. or if it has the suffix of anything benzone. And if it does, put it in the garbage, throw it away. And as a matter of fact, throw it away and tag me, right? I want to see it, tag me, I'll repost it. And let's start a little movement of throwing away some crappy sunscreen. Breastfeeding and breast milk, you probably heard this before. It's pretty essential to a child's health. It, it's very essential. Now, if you're not breastfeeding, I did a show on formulas, go check that out. But breastfeeding in itself provides specific proteins and fats for the baby's development, we know this. But it also provides immunoglobulins, which are the antibodies that help the child's immune system. Specifically, they're getting a big dose of IgA. And it's super important at protecting the body against bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses, right? But it's also going to help fortify not only the intestinal tract of the baby, but also the respiratory tract. Right, so if there is a problem with the baby and breastfeeding, a lot of people don't go into the work of what Stephen Lynn talks about. Dr. Stephen Lynn, one of my first guests on the show, and what he talks about is the, or the, even the Breathe Institute out here in LA, their Instagram page, they talk about tongue ties being a major issue for not latching. And I think it's something that conventionally we haven't accepted and brought in yet, but we really wanna check on tongue ties for the baby 
if they're not latching because that could be the main reason why there's trouble breastfeeding, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about more about jaw development later, but here's an important point. In our American society, we over sanitize our children, period. We over clean and it's with the intent that we're protecting our children, right? On the contrary, what we're seeing is that it can actually be hurting the child's immune system. Now, this is the hygiene hypothesis, and it's a hypothesis that's based on many observations. Now, I will say as a caveat before I go into it, there's no long-term randomized trials that we've seen going deep into the hygiene hypothesis, but the hypothesis is very much so well accepted in the community, okay? So kids are not exposed to the same level of germs as they used to be, we know that. And it turns out the very children that were raised with exposure to dirt or, or uh, a diverse terrain, they tend to be healthier over time. And it's most likely because their immune system and their gut are being exposed to a lot of the bacteria, virus, fungi, parasites, microbes that are helping train and strengthen the immune system and the gut of the child. So we worry so much about our child being sick, but for me, we have to let them and their immune system be trained. When I was in the pediatrics shift, in school, I was more worried about a child who never gets sick versus the one who gets sick a few times a year. You want a child who gets sick, not always, right? Not chronically sick, but the, nor the normalcy behind a child being sick is being taken away, right? We have to make sure that our child's immune system, because that's a sign that our child's immune system is being trained and trained and trained. So diseases implicated in over sanitization are things like allergies, asthma, eczema, chronic sinusitis, food allergies and intolerances. Are we seeing this in children? If your children does fall into any of these disease categories, you wanna pay closer attention, right? It could be over sanitization of the home, of the hands, not letting your child roll around in the dirt. I mean, me, when I have children, they're gonna be little hippie kids who are gonna have no shoes on, long hair, running around, rolling around in the dirt, going out in nature with me all the time. And we've lost touch with that natural play and display of microbes which, which in, inherently our body needs, especially as children, which is gonna set the tone through adolescence and through adulthood. Community gives you immunity from illusion. The illusion that we fall into every single day, the illusion that we're separate. My God, the greatest illusion of all time. When you find your community, it's not just a congregation of like-minded people. Real community, real social connection provides space. A space for you to be who you are without that egoic illusion of separation a space for you to be your truest, most authentic, most loving self. And boy, does that feel good. My God, to take off those false identities, those jackets made of lead, and to show up without fear of judgment, to be seen, to feel seen, to be heard, to feel heard by a group of people who support, love, and appreciate you and your highest and truest self. Well, that's health. And listen to me, and listen to me closely. Community at this level is the most important intervention for health before diet, before exercise, before smoking, before drinking, before even detoxifying your home. A community of people who reflect your authenticity, your greatness, and mostly, mostly, most importantly, the love that you are is health. That's healing, and that's number one. Community, community, community. You want to surround yourself, and this is the community equals immunity part. You want to surround yourself with people on the deeper level who really allow that, allow you to show up that way, allow you to be your most authentic, highest self, and also are inspiring you simultaneously. You're looking at them and you go, God damn, that person is great. That person is illustrating, radiating, characterizing, personifying greatness. And that, that inspiration leads you to grow more. That's true community. So two essential times of the day for light exposure, especially if you're out of balance physically or mentally or emotionally, sunrise and sunset, right? And this may be a problem for some people. I don't care if you can't wake up early, set your alarm. And I don't care if you have something to do in the evening, change that because you got to put your health first. I want you to think about it. Most of our evolutionary life was on this input every single day. We evolved with our body knowing exactly what to do and how to operate based on these signals. So again, if you're suffering with any conditions, you gotta start with the basics. And these basics are meaning the sun that's giving your body those inputs for daily health. And what are the messages? Let's go into them. 
Sunrise. Well, admittedly, this is one of the most challenging ones for me, right? Because I'm a particularly little bit of a night owl. So getting up that early, especially to see the sunrise, can be a problem sometimes. And particularly where I live, I live up in the mountains. So it takes a while to come down, get to the beach and see the sunrise or get to a place where I can see the horizon. Uh, but I'll be moving back down to the beach. So it's going to be an everyday occurrence. But you don't need to live at the beach. Hell, you don't even need to see the full sunrise on the horizon. All you need is that spectrum of colors. It's being given off to you. And it varies depending on where the sun is on the horizon, but you really want to make sure you're getting out there. If like check check your time and see sunrise tomorrow, and you know it's at let's say 6:05 a.m. Get out there by 5:55, right? 10 minutes early, so you can see that whole process happen. A foundation to any health condition is getting enough light at the right times of day. If you have issues sleeping, or depression, or anxiety, or your brain's not sharp as it usually is, exposure to sunrise and sunset should be the first interventions that your doctor's giving you, or at the very least, that to complement those treatments. So we're talking about evolutionary biology. Our bodies not only benefit from these signals, but they expect them daily. So a new study that was published in the current biology magazine earlier this year, it was called Let There Be Circadian Light. And they saw that the wavelengths of light at sunrise and sunset make the biggest impact on our brain when it comes to mood, but also not only that, cognition, alertness, and memory. The cells in your retina are responding to these colors and the signal's being sent straight right to the SCN of the brain. And that's getting all the gears going in your body. In reference to mood, Guess what neurotransmitter is being released during sunrise? Serotonin. That's the same feel-good neurotransmitters that is deficient in people with depression, which is partially the cause, but not all of it. When your body's flooded with this during sunrise, this neurotransmitter that is salvaged by SSRIs like Lexapro and Prozac, well, that's retraining your body, right, to start seeing the sunset, and then you're releasing these daily over and over and over, and your body's becoming used to this serotonin flood every morning, and again, if you're being prescribed these medications, but not the wavelengths of sunrise or sunset, then your doctor's missing the whole point of healing. But don't take my word for it. Go outside starting today, every single day for the next 30 days, see the sunrise and see the sunset. And see, write it down, how your mood changes otherwise. Go back to your doctor after 30 days and reassess where you are with your medication. Because it could be that it's lowered or you're off of it. I'm not making any guarantees, but it's such an important intervention to make. Now check this out, here's one of the craziest things. Did you know that if you see the sun rise, it can help dictate your sleep, the quality of your sleep, 15 to 16 hours later, why? Well, serotonin is needed to produce melatonin. This happens in your pineal gland. So when you watch the sun rise, what you're doing is you're setting off that serotonin every single day. Your body's getting used to releasing it in the morning. That's setting you up for nighttime melatonin release. You see the sunset, you get a flood of melatonin, you're setting yourself up for success in a nice sleep-wake cycle, which is integral, integral to your overall health. And then another plus is that when you see that sunset, your cortisol is starting to trend down. It's been trending down throughout the day, but it's gonna hit its lowest point. And when it's hit its lowest point, melatonin is starting to reach its highest point. And then you're putting yourself in a really relaxed state. Your body's saying, I'm tired, get me to sleep. Because mind you, melatonin is not just a sleepy hormone. It's essential for antioxidant, reducing oxidation and inflammation in the body. It's also an anti-cancer. It also stimulates the immune system. Proper melatonin production at night is dependent, dependent on how much serotonin you're producing in the day, plus dietary interventions, but how much serotonin you're producing in a day, that's setting you up for optimizing melatonin. And remember, not just for sleep, but all of those other beneficiary effects in the body. So you see, and then when you wake up, rejuvenated, restored, you're able to wake up early in the morning feeling good, and then you see that sunset again. Just like you charge your cell phone, every single day when it's dying, we have to make sure we charge our cells. And there's three ways you charge your cells. Mineral rich water, sun, and grounding. Put your feet on the ground, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But those are the non-negotiables. Make sure you're doing all three. That's how you charge your cells, just like you do your cellular device. We put so much care. When we're, when we're on 1%, we run and we find the nearest charger, but we don't do that with our body. Now, if you live in Pacific Northwest or North Dakota, wherever it's lacking sun, all you need is day. All you need is daytime light. Those rays, those wavelengths are essential. The sun doesn't necessarily need to be out. But back to water. Did you know that most people are dehydrated in the morning? And I bet, I bet you're actually reaching for your water right now if you have it near you while you're listening because so many people do that when we do our talks. But let that be a reminder 
that water is essential throughout the day. And actually, many symptoms that people go to doctors for are often just dehydration. So I want you to make sure you're filling up that water in the morning, get a glass or stainless steel one. You heard me talk about my favorite one earlier in this episode. The more ounces, the better. Fill that sucker up with minerals, make sure it's charged, especially if you're going to the workplace and be sure to drink it up. Get a goal, set an alarm, write time ticks throughout the day on the water bottle with a with a Sharpie, whatever holds you accountable. Next step to get to having the best work day ever, your morning ritual. Now this is essential, the morning ritual, because it's the one time, and as you do it more, you'll find that you're boosting your creativity and productivity. You need a ritual, I can't stress it enough, and it needs to be consistent, right? 30 days of rituals, do it. Write it down, make sure you're holding yourself accountable, put an alarm. If you do it for 30 days, see if it improves your work. You'll often find your creativity and productivity is much better. And as a bonus, when you're doing your ritual, you can ground, get outside, put your feet on the ground, do these rituals, speak them out loud. And now at this point, you've seen the sun, you set your cortisol awakening response for the next day, you set yourself up to get a good night's sleep already just by waking up. You've hydrated yourself, you've done your morning ritual, you put your feet on the ground. At this point, you've done more than most people do before they get into work, but I'm gonna give you some more tips. So fasting and exercise, I'm actually a really big fan of intermittent fasting. So the magic marker is about 13 hours for intermittent fasting. Did a whole show on fasting. I actually spoke with the queen, Dr. Queen of fasting, Dr. Shah, talking about the benefits of fasting, particularly intermittent fasting, right? Your last meal can be at 8 p.m. Just make sure there's 13 hours in between your next meal or more. Sometimes I'll take up to 16 hours, but really important for the immune system, for your hormones, for your nervous system, for detoxification. It's powerful stuff and you can do it every single day once you get into the groove, right? Now, when it comes to working out, this is a time thing, right? Some folks can only really work out after work, great. If For me, it's if you're getting it in, the movement, the working out, the detoxification, the stimulating the immune system, all that, all the benefits, those really good benefits of working out, I don't care when you do it. I actually prefer and suggest it more during the morning because that's when your cortisol is, is its highest. You don't really wanna bring up that cortisol late at night because it can potentially disrupt your sleep. So for me, I know if I work out in the morning, and by the time I sit down, I'm ready for work, man, that is already a cup of coffee in itself. The other thing you can do is after that workout, take a cold shower before work. If you got hot and sweaty from the workout, jump in, take a cold shower. It's super, super important. Do this for a month, actually. You're going to find two things. Your energy is much, much, much more consistent and you're getting less sick. You feel your body be more resilient. And that's because the nervous system is tied to the immune system. The cold acts as a hormetic response, just like working out a good stressor on the body and your immune system is gonna benefit. So what about food? What about breakfast? What's a good breakfast look like? Well, it's gotta be nutrient dense, right? You're gonna be breaking that fast, that intermittent fast. Go for something that's protein rich. It's gonna keep you satiated so you're not crashing in the morning before, uh, before lunch. I actually tend to do something like tempeh or tofu scramble with greens, some tomato, some avocado, maybe some sweet potato, something that I know is giving me the vitamins and minerals that I need to not only recover from a workout, but if my brain is going to be utilizing so much brain energy for productivity at work, I know that I'm going to be supporting my body too. Really important through the workday. One of the worst things we could do is just sit down from nine to five with a get up break for lunch. Make sure that you're finding time to walk around. And if you can, if you don't have stairs in your office, walk around. Walk around the building, walk around your home, do some squats right next to your desk, do some push-ups, do some sit-ups. Just being able to move your blood and lymph is so important and you're getting more blood to your brain. So what about lunch and after lunch? Make sure you eat nutrient-dense lunch. Here's your chance to get multiple colors of the rainbow. Whatever works best for your body, get in tune with your body, what vegetables, what fruits really help and which ones really you don't feel good around. But a big salad with raw veggies or some fruits, cooked or steamed, whatever it is, here's your chance to get the rainbow of antioxidants in every color of fruits or vegetables. Stay away from the heavy stuff like chicken and gravy or mashed potatoes and butter. Uh, there were similar foods like that in the hospitals that I worked at. That's all dead food. You want live, lively food that's not processed, that is giving you those vitamins and minerals and antioxidants to get you to the afternoon, to the end of the workday. Amongst all of this, I said, for having your best workday ever. I'm gonna be honest with you. None of these recommendations matter if you hate the job you give your life to. Ask yourself this, and this is the most important tip I can give. Are you living your purpose? Are you aware of what your purpose is? 
And most importantly, does your job, the very things that takes up so much of our life, reflect the greatness that you bring into this world? Life is so, so, so short. It's a snap of a finger, I guarantee that. I still remember so clearly when I graduated middle school, high school, my first day of college, my first day as a doctor. Life is shorter than you can imagine, and it speeds up as you get older. And you can feel it speeding up. Sometimes the best laid plans that you have can be cut short very quickly, right? We work at a job we hate, we live for the weekend, we save money, we retire, and we die. But who created this standard, right? It's a lead blanket on your light. It's a matted tarp on the radiance to uplift others that you have. So we owe it to ourselves to be excited about work, right? To want to share our work with the world, to transform our gifts into what people call quote unquote work. But for you, it's your art, it's your fulfillment, it's your gift to others. It's never, never, ever too late to live that life that you came here to live. So I challenge you, think about what lights a fire in your soul, what you've been gifted with and that people have been admiring within you for years. And can you incorporate that, if not into a job, into a hobby? But can that hobby grow into a business? And can you share your extraordinary gifts with us? Because I promise you, by changing yourself, by changing your work, you change the trajectory of your life and the people's lives that you touch. Look at a kid. You'll see a kid hug when it's happy, love when it's feeling loving, be in fear when it's scared. But really, coming back, their default state is always loving. Their default state is always open. Their default state is always curious. And... How many of us, and when did we lose that? So take this time on this podcast or after to go back into the, that time in your life, where you were, what the smells were, what you saw, your friends, what your experiences were, right? And people were like, oh, when I was a kid, it was so carefree, it was so easy. But what I'm trying to tell you is that that's accessible even in your adult body. So when it comes to fear, we've been given this, teaching of fear because we live in a fear state. And whether it's from your parents, whether it's from teachers, whether it's from even religion, right? We're given these rules of which we need to live by, right? And of course, if you're living with your base state of love, then everything else beautiful sprouts from that without rules, right? But society, man, how many of us listening want to be, do, have, say, express something, but society told us we can't? Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot wear that. That is, not access that is not acceptable in the streets. That is not acceptable at this party. That's not acceptable in the workplace. Okay, understandable. Oh, you can't say that. You really want to sing, but you're not a good singer. Remember in eighth grade when you were told to stop singing because you're terrible? But my soul wants to sing. It wants to express the love that it has in the form of song. You can't do that. How about dance? How about cook? How about anything? Think about how much of your life is being weighed down by that proverbial lead blanket that is fear and how we were told and conditioned at such a young age that we cannot just be, we cannot just express, we cannot just surrender to exactly the way we want to express ourselves. And I know this is resonating with a lot of you because you will soon find that you don't even feel good in your body. You feel you are contracted. You feel those impulses. And, and the more we contract it, the more we throw lead blankets on it, the more those impulses become whispers. When we were a kid, they were loud. We followed exactly what we wanted to do, where we wanted to do it, how we wanted to do it. But all of it was based in authenticity. As you throw lead blankets over your life, they become whispers. And your soul says, hey, please do this. I really want to do this. And you go, I think I heard something, but I'm just going to continue being in that contractive fear state. But what I'm submitting to you is maybe if you take time, you get quiet, bring out a journal, close your eyes, be in solitude, take some time to get back in touch with that child in you that is trying to come out and trying to express itself without rules, right? Without society saying you cannot, you should not, you will not. And understand in your highest moments, how that feels. Understand that those moments when you're expressing whatever wants to express out of your soul in love, in curiosity, in enjoyment, and in expression, you're honoring your highest self. And when you're honoring your highest self, 
you're embodying your highest self. And when you're embodying your highest self, you're living your life the way life is intended to be lived. And the beautiful thing, and we spoke about this so many times on the show, is when you're embodying your highest self, you are giving people permission, whether consciously or unconsciously, to embody their highest selves just by you being you, which is the craziest thing. You don't need to do anything. You just need to embody that highest self. One of the most important steps that when people say, hey, Dr. G, what are the steps I do to change my life? What's the most important thing? If you're not taking an audit of, of yourself and every single day and where you stand and how you're showing up, then you're missing it and you're on autopilot and life is just happening to you rather than for you, okay? So the first step is taking the time out. Just every single day, find 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour to look at yourself. So ask yourself this one question, actually two. Is it serving me? Yes or no? Whatever it is, a quality of yourself, a person, a situation, a circumstance, is it serving me, yes or no? And is it rooted in love or fear? Two questions every single day. Is it rooted in love or fear? You'll find that most of the things in your life are rooted in fear. And it's interesting because it's not our fault. We're taught this through authoritative figures, through media, Whoever it is has taught us to live in fear. So ask yourself, is it in love or fear? Is it serving me, yes or no? Then take the time to look at those aspects of yourself, how you're showing up, what are the qualities that you are bringing to the table, and are they serving you? And if the question is no, take the time to recreate those, right? So if you're showing up without of integrity, if you're showing up not being compassionate, not being nurturing as you want to, right? Not being as vocal as you want to, speak it with affirmations. I am vocal, I am compassionate, I am nurturing. And you'll see, if you pay close attention to speaking that truth out loud, and make sure you speak it. It's not just a thinking thing. Make sure you speak it aloud and speak it loud. It's not just a creation speaking thing, but it's you have to have the awareness because what you'll see is when you speak those things into existence, you'll see the person, place, thing, situation, circumstance come. You'll attract it, you'll manifest it. And that person, place, situation, circumstance, if you pay close attention, you'll see that this, you've attracted this person, place, situation, circumstance to show you that you are that creation.